life quakes, those major events that shake our beliefs and disrupt our trajectories, are frightening. We know what we're losing, but we have no idea whether we will land on our feet and where. These life quakes, as Bruce Feider calls them, are also essential ingredients to our growth. They force us to loosen our grip on what we currently hold, surrender to some loss, and make room for a new transformed self. There is no denying that the current pandemic and the peaking of social injustice with their devastating damage constitute such a life quake for all of us as individuals, communities, and institutions. Institutions of higher education have some unique, monumental role to play. Our students, their parents, and our communities look for us for sense-making so that we put this in context, connect the dots, and make reasonable predictions. They look for us to equip our graduates with the human capacities the future will demand of them. They look for us to develop the science and technology that explain, predict, and cure our ills. They look for us as rule models for handling major disruptions and rising to the occasion. My name is Fatma Mili. I'm the Dean of the College of Computing and Informatics here at UNC Charlotte, celebrating 20 years of innovation and commitment to technology for good. The College of Computing and Informatics espouses three values, acknowledging inequity and doing everything in our power to address it, taking responsibility for the social implications of technology, and valuing community and collaboration over selfish interests and competition. The COVID-19 pandemic, its impact, both indiscriminate and unequal on different communities, gave us pause. The continuous killings of Black men and women at the hands of police shook our world further and sent us all in a journey of reflection. Do we have the right values? Are we truly living them? What agency do we have? And are we really exercising it to its fullest? Are we exercising it well? Let's focus on the first value. We acknowledge inequity and do everything in our power to address it. To address inequity, we first need to do more than just acknowledge it. We need to understand it, see it, feel it. For example, two years ago, we examined the correlation between student success and the socioeconomic status of their family. We found that students with the same SAT scores, the same high school GPA, had distinctly different success rates depending on the socioeconomic status of their parents. This observed positive correlation is an undeniable manifestation of inequity. It is an unbearable injustice. We then needed to understand what of our actions, policies, procedures, and pedagogies contributed to these inequities. For our faculty and staff, it was a process of collective discovery. Discovery of the misconceptions we had about our students' lives, constraints, challenges, and hurdles. Discovery of the way seemingly innocent policies advantaged some students over others. Discovery of the way the language we use in our syllabi might exclude or discourage. Discovery of the way in which our choice of whose work we cite and celebrate sends strong messages of belonging or not belonging. This was hard and important work that our faculty and staff wholeheartedly pursued with passion and urgency. The revelation was that we all had considerably more power and agency than we first suspected. We all had agency that was not being put to use to combat inequity we started changing that. The brutal killings this summer of Ahmed Arbery, Brianna Taylor, and the graphic murder of George Taylor broke our hearts and shook our conscience. It awakened us to the certainty that we did not know enough, that we did not do enough. It awakened us to the individual and collective responsibility to learn more, to acknowledge louder, to work faster, and to do more to address inequity and injustice. It awakened us to the notion that agency is not a fixed quantity handed to us that we can then go and spend or save. 
It is our duty to develop it and grow it to respond to these urgent issues of our times. As a College of Computing and Informatics, we looked at our discipline as a source for agency, and we looked at our teaching, research, and engagement work as the contacts for our agency. Inequity, in all of its forms, is human-created, human-cultivated, and yes, very often technology-supported. Equity rooted in compassion is also a human capacity that is cultivated and can be supported and enhanced through computing technology. Indeed, at the root of any form of inequity is the false notion of a value gap in which some lives are worth more than others, that some humans are more deserving than others. Distance and ignorance breed indifference. Knowledge and familiarity breed empathy. Computing bridge distances. Computing erases ignorance. With computing and communication technology, ignorance about others' plight and living conditions is no longer a fatality but a choice. Computing breaks distances and enables us to know, understand, and empathize with humans outside of our daily circles of family, friends, and colleagues. Computing tools have been used to breathe life into our understanding of conditions and experiences different from our own. In the I Hear You project, Oxfam gives voice to refugees from Syria, Burundi, and Congo by filming actors reading their narratives. In 2015, the UN Refugees Organization also used virtual reality technology to bring natural disasters home by playing them in familiar places like Boston and New York. Virtual reality has been used frequently and successfully to approximate and let users experience the challenges of living with disability, the pain of losing a job and becoming homeless, and the tremendous damage from facing racism and suspicion repeatedly as a child, adolescent, and adult. It is undeniable these virtual reality experiences are far from the real thing but they can be very effective in developing empathy and understanding. Imagine for a minute the quality of our decisions and votes if every time we had to first experience through technology the lives of people affected by our decisions and votes. While we still have a long way to go as a society to reduce racial, geographic, and ethnic distances, the biggest frontier in empathy remains temporal. The biggest frontier is at the heart of the most important existential threat humanity faces, global warming. Empathizing with people from future generations proved to be a major challenge for the human brain. In the words of philosopher Roman Krzysztof the present is colonizing the future. We treat the future as a distant colonial outpost where we dump ecological degradation, nuclear waste, public debt, and technological risk. We are making decisions today that are endangering the voiceless humans of tomorrow. Our brains are unable or unwilling to grasp the connection between our actions today and the pain and suffering of the humans of the future. Computing technologies and systems can be put to work to complement humans' capacities and help us make more responsible and equitable decisions, to bridge from the individual behaviors to their collective impact. Indeed, the current situation around race and justices is but one illustration of what's happening on a daily basis. Small, innocuous actions and decisions that add up to create racist systems, environmental disasters, and other outcomes that no one wants. Every day, we, good people, consume resources whose extraction damages the environment, we buy cheap products fabricated using child labor, we vote for policies affecting other people's children, we endorse wars waged in faraway places, destroying homes and lives, we then close our borders to refugees, overlooking the connection between our consumption and our votes and the refugees' plight. We do this not because we're mean-spirited people who want to do harm. 
but because we fail to see the connection between our small local decisions and their global overwhelming outcome. We fail to see because these are complex systems that behave in non-intuitive ways. In complex systems, impacts are additive rather than one-to-one. It's not just what I do, but what many of us do. In complex systems, impacts are delayed rather than immediate. We may not see the impact of our actions today, this year, in this election cycle, or even in our lifetime, but the impact is there being accumulated. In complex systems, impact manifests in global patterns of outcomes rather than specific outcomes. Yet, most of our education and training is around the one-to-one cause and effect that is observed within a reasonable time frame, and that gives us a reproducible specific outcome. Yes, our science education must change and include complex systems thinking. In the meantime, Computing must come to the rescue and complement our thinking, our decision-making, and our communication around the impacts of any decision we are advocating. Computing must bring complex modeling at the fingertips of every student, every scientist, every policymaker, and every citizen. Computing tools have the power to make good people make good empathetic decisions. This must become a priority. In summary, we must go beyond doing everything currently in our power to address inequity. We must go beyond doing no harm. We must work proactively at developing new ways, cultivating new power, and using it to create transformative change. We must do it now. Life quakes are unsettling, but they're also wake-up calls and times to reflect, re-examine, let go of the unequal and inequitable world, and welcome a better version of ourselves. Life quakes call on us to reflect and act with compassion and urgency. So, what values are you living by? Have you re-examined them lately? Are you living them? Thank you.